Adesso il prossimo ospite, in realtà interviene con un video, ci ha mandato una presentazione con l'audio incorporato, corretto? Lui si occupa di social engagement, of, oh, questa cosa è tremendo, social engagement a Yahoo Research, mandiamolo, Alejandro James. My name is Alex James and I work at Yahoo Research um, and I'm going to talk about data as a medium, um, a human-centered perspective. And so the first thing that I want to do is um, give uh, a little bit of context and so for this we need to think a bit about what's, in, what's been happening in the world of computing and um, more specifically what's been happening in the world around us. Um, how are we changing our own behavior and the way that we interact not just with other people, but also with the uh, environment. So if you look at this photograph, you see a child um, by the lake and, you know, maybe he doesn't have any device that he's playing with to, to interact. But the reality is that um, nowadays we find ourselves very frequently inter interacting with all kinds of devices and many kinds of stations. And so as a result of that, um, I think one of the things that's happening is that we're using devices to interact both with the environment and with ourselves. So from that perspective, um, we're interacting not just with the devices themselves, situation, uh, wherever we go and it's not just cell phones it's tablets laptops computers all kinds of things and it's it's getting to the point where um, it, it's really part of our life from from very early on and and this photo illustrates it so the kid is, is cooking with an app um, for a tablet and uh, so it's great you know he can make all kinds of things um, but then if you look at this photo you know there's a kitchen in the back um, you know, he, he won't really get to touch the actual cooking ingredients that he's, that he's cooking with. They're all imaginary, and he's got some toys next to the um, tablet. But in reality, he's, he's just interacting with, with data. And so data, in this case, is really the medium. And it's in, in this child's case, you know, it might be uh, the medium that is, that is going to teach him how to cook. Um, and so... Um, I think this is really, really an important shift in, in, in our daily lives. And that's one of the main points that I want to... ...early on, and, and this photo illustrates it. So the kid is, is cooking with an app um, for a tablet. And uh, so it's great, you know, he can make all kinds of things. Um, but then if you look at this photo, you know, there's a kitchen in the back, um, you know, he, he won't really get to touch the actual cooking ingredients that he's, that he's cooking with. They're all imaginary and he's got some toys next to the um, tablet, but in reality, he's, he's just interacting with, with data. And so data, in this case, is really the medium and it's in, in this child's case, you know, it might be uh, the medium that is, that is going to teach him how to cook. Um, And so um, I think this is really, really an important shift in, in, in our daily lives. And that's one of the main points that I want to... So if we look at this shift, then, you know, we could say that um, we're data. Um, there's this, an old saying in English that says, you are what you eat, and uh, we're constantly consuming data in all kinds of forms and, and uh, at different times during the day, throughout the day, email, social networks, um, SMS, phone, and so on and so forth. So uh, more than a statement, this is a question. Are we really becoming data? Um, you know, we have our profiles on social networks, we have our home pages, we have our blogs, 
So in many ways, we're representing ourselves through, through data or information, and we can talk about this um, a bit later on. Um, but um, I think there's no question that um, things are changing in that, in that respect. And at the same time that we as individuals are increasingly being represented by data, Um, then I would argue that so is everything else, like in the examples that I showed earlier. Um, and it's not just cooking apps, you know, it's pretty much everything we do. The stock market, um, everything really evolves around, around data. One of the problems, however, is that um, in spite of all of the benefits of technology and all of the great things that we can do with computers and tablets and all of these devices, we're really great at, about, uh, at adapting to, to bad technology. Okay, so um, we know that technology and computing are not perfect. There are many um, problems with, with interaction and, and many of the devices that we use are really difficult to use. They're not natural, but we learn to adapt and we're really good at adapting to them. And the problem is that we're becoming used to that, okay? And not that this particular example is a good one in the sense that, you know, the app might be great, um, and the kid, you know, he can't make a fire, which is a good thing. He can't uh, burn the food. But will he ever really make a real meal with this? No, right? I mean, will he learn the same thing that he would learn in a real kitchen? Um, no. So the point here is, again, that this, this um, places a ring around us that, that um, kind of is, is, is basically kind of like a mediation device between us and, and, and the rest of the world. Um, if we look at the changes that uh, we're undergoing and where this new paradigm that I see of data as a medium, you know, where the impact is, um, I think there are three main spaces. Um, the first one is the personal space, um, and I'll say in a, in a mo moment what it means. The second one is first uh, space, we have extensions of the body, so this basically refers to ubiquitous computing, uh, wearable devices, you know, sensors on, on sneakers, on clothing, uh, eyeglasses, um, and just a simple uh, mobile phone, tablets, and so on and so forth. Um, the ambient um, space refers to things like interactive architecture, which we're beginning to see, and I, and I think we will see increasingly um, in the next uh, few years where buildings react to our presence or projections and information is projected all over the place. And then the third one is conceptual where, you know, we become friends with many people all, all around the world and the uh, distance is getting shorter, communications are getting faster. And so our notion of space and time are really, have really changed significantly in the last uh, few years. Now, um, there are kind of different spaces and there are many ways of drawing um, them, you know, these dimensions or, or uh, uh, you know, of thinking of these three. Um, but I think that the three have a strong impact in our lives and that um, in reality, all of these three respond to a single change in technology and in the way that we use technology. And so what I want to cover um, for throughout the rest of the talk um, is basically the three most fundamental questions that I think we need to address um, as uh, researchers and as technologists and, and even the businesses that work in, in, in these areas. And so the first one relates to information value. So what is the value of, of information? Okay, I, I think that's extremely important. Um, at this point in, in the history of, of, of man, more than in a, at any other time. Um, the second one is social structure. Our understanding of social structure is is very shallow, um, and we're representing um, this understanding in the way that we do the analysis of data in very simple ways and often in very naive ways. And so, um, an understanding of what social structure means and and what are the elements that we need to take into account is really crucial moving forward in relation to the first question as as well as to some of the other questions that I will ask. The third one have to have the, th the third uh, set of questions have to do with um, how information travels and, and what effect it has 
Um, so the first one is interaction, the second one is transfer, and the third one is effect. So with interaction, I'm referring to interaction between humans. Okay, what happens when I interact with somebody, either face-to-face -face or through one of these devices. It's not uncommon to see people texting each other, even if they're sitting next to each other at a conference, for example, or writing emails to each other. If, you know, they sit next to each other at the office. And I'm sure many of you in the audience have, have done this. Um, so what does it mean when two people interact with each other? The second question has to do with transfer. Um, what does it mean when I transfer information to another person? Okay, when I retweet something, when I or I send an email, um, is that influence? Is it just a you know passing on of the message? Um, we we don't know. Okay, it's very context dependent, but it's one of the fundamental questions. And the third one has to do with effect, and it's exactly that. What happens after I receive that information, or after that? person that I send the information to receives it. What, what is the effect of receiving that information? What does that person do? And so I think these three are really the most fundamental questions. So let's take a look a little bit of history um, and the history of media and, and data and, and what's been happening, why these questions are so important right now. So the first one has to do with uh, media production and this is not a mathematical scientific graph, it's just an illustration. And basically what it says is that um, the way that people have produced content has um, changed significantly in the last hundred years or so. Um, and um, historically, um, if we looked at the beginning of history, media impact. Um, and and that, that's really huge. And I think it has implications that are much bigger than we imagine because it's still fairly early on. But the main point here is that the production of media has changed dramatically in the last few years. And now we've entered a new age, and this is the age of sharing. And I'll talk about how this relates to the data question. And so it's come to the point almost where we say, you know, you can say, well, I share, therefore I exist. Um, there was an article in the New York Times last week where they were interviewing some parents of newborn babies that were opening um, email and social network accounts for them um, before they, from before they were born, just to make sure they had social presence. And um, it's kind of getting to the point for some people where it's extremely important and it's almost mandatory to have a presence in these social um, networks. So the old time, at least in terms of media, was, um, you know, I have photos and I have photos of, the photos are for me and my family. Um, only experts produce quality content. Um, and then sharing is one-to-one. -one. You know, I share with my friends, but it's mainly one-to-one. -one. The new paradigm, um, the photos are for friends and for everyone else. You know, I think most people nowadays, when they photograph, they're thinking of sending it out and sharing them, sharing the photos. Um, anyone can produce good co content. I put this in quotes because the quality of content is subjective, and uh, a lot of people think that there's a lot of good content, but in reality, maybe there's just... Um, there are many more people producing content, so we see more good content, but at the same time, there's a lot, a lot of bad content, and it's not comparable to professional content. And the third one is that sharing is, is one too many. Um, so before it was very much one, one to one, and now it's one, one too many. In terms of data, what does this mean? Um, the first implication is fragmentation, and it's not just a social sharing, it comes before that, um, but fragmentation is crucial because it basically means that um, We've gotten used to bits and pieces of, of information and data. Okay, we're not um, so interested anymore in reading full-length articles. We're more interested in, in snippets and, and segments. The second one is aggregation, and the fact that um, the more we know about multiple sources, the better it seems, at least. So we tend to um, place a lot of importance on aggregating. A lot of information is, is consumers of media and consumers of data. And the third one is multi-authorship, which is an implication coming from the other two, which basically means that rather than looking at a single author for a lot of information, we're, we're increasingly receiving it from multiple sources. Um, some of the uh, historical precursors to this, I would say, you know, one is you know, the fact that uh, mechanical reproduction had made, had made a huge change in, in, in history um, because um, people were for the first time able to easily 
replicate and duplicate uh, content. The second one is MTV, and you might think this is a bit uh, strange, but MTV was one of the first uh, venues really that had this very quick um, scene changes and you know the music videos were unique in that sense that you had many many scenes and the scenes were changing very quickly and if you do a parallel if you draw a parallel between what's happening on the web now and what's happening with YouTube and technology um, it really goes back to that where we we got used to the people that grew up with MTV are the ones that are creating the technology now almost um, you know we kind of became used to these short quick snippets and changes of of, of information. And the third one is SMS, which again is a fairly new phenomena, um, but it, it, it kind of encouraged this exchange of short uh, messages between between people. And so it's I think it's interesting to look at this uh, progression of events. The next question is, you know, what is the role of computing and how has that changed? Okay, and um, I think, you know, one of the statements that I often make is, can you bite milk with a computing? And, you know, people sometimes wonder, well, of course, you know, I can buy milk anytime. But the point is that, you know, if computing infrastructure broke down, you know, the milk probably wouldn't make it to your store. Okay, so it, it, is, it is part of everything. Um, and um, technology, you know, there are many kinds of technology. I'm not talking just about uh, uh, computing technology. Um, but technology has played a, a role in, in daily life um, historically for forever. Um, if we look at even the most basic technologies. But I think there's no doubt that um, computing technology is having a much greater impact than any other technology. Perhaps the car or maybe electricity um, had um, impacts that were somewhat close, but I would say that computing is, is even greater. And um, one of the things about this curve, again, it's just an illustration, it's not really, a, it's not a mathematical curve, uh, is that in, in all technologies, I think, you know, there's a, a sort of an ad adoption period and, and then um, it kind of goes up, it's, it's used by many people and then it kind of flattens out in the sense that everybody has it and you stop thinking about it and it becomes kind of uh, invisible. And, um, and I think that's where we are with some computing technologies and, and, and mobile technologies. Same thing is happening with, with data. And uh, I think we're entering the stage where um, it's kind of the big, the big shift with all, all of the data is coming in and we're just beginning to try to understand and figure out what to do with, with all of this data. And the day will come where it's, it's so um, common for us to make all of our decisions based on data. And in some ways we already do. Um, you know, when we uh, buy things, when we... Um, the next one is the role of culture. And again, this is not really a very good graph, but um, basically what I want to say with this one is that um, it's been traditionally assumed that computing technologies are culturally neutral. And so the role of culture in developing of technologies um, seems to be... Uh, forgotten in some ways. And of course there are many researchers that are doing work in this area, but for the most part it's really not considered, uh, you know, in the sense that you see the same products in many countries and and for the most part the only change is the language. Um, in some ways what this means is that culture is being discretized and, and saying, okay, you know, it's all the same and the only difference is the language. Into how this is happening. Um, but we all know that technology is never neutral. Um, as any technologies in the past, you know, what they do tend to do is maybe homogenize up to some extent. Um, but different cultures do use technologies in different ways. And, and this is one of the areas where we still have a big lack of um, understanding. And we don't know what the inflection points are and, and, and what's causing the changes and so on and, and, and so forth. So now let's, let's um, step back a bit and look at um, big data. And, um, all of what I've said before has a big impact on big data because that's when you might start seeing some patterns to help you understand some of the issues that I described before. So the big question is, or the first one is, you know, is there information in, in big data? Back for a second. So for the person at the bottom, you know, who's saying what the location was, um, you know, if this is a, my family member, somebody that's very close to me, then maybe this is important. If it's somebody that I'm meeting and I'm on the mobile phone, um, then it's really important because I don't know where they are and I can just follow their, their um, updates and find out where they are. 
And the same with, you know, the questions at the top. Depends on who's asking the question and, and, and who's answering and then the connections. If you're the one reading this, what is your connection to those individual people? that post uh, the answers. And when I say connected, it's not just about your contacts or friends, about who they are, but what you do and how what you do is connected, okay? And so I'm clearly not the first one to think about this, and this is a famous quote, unapparent connections are stronger than ones which are obvious. And this was not a quote by somebody who created a social network, um, at least not this century. It's by Heraclitus in the fifth century BC. And so uh, one of the major shifts that um, I think is happening is that how we're connected may be increasingly more important than who you are, okay? And this is a strong statement to make. Um, but I think um, that if we look at the way things are going, you know, it, maybe we're not so far away from that. And then it asks questions about identity and, and privacy and so on and so forth. So I'll just leave you with those questions. So... Are we talking about a new area of social mediation? You know, if, if we take my hypothesis that, we're, that data is becoming a new mediation um, mechanism, then is social mediation the re really the new mechanism? Is it, is it all about the network? And I would say that it's starting to look Okay, um, so three really important questions, which I... Um, asked before, so related to, to the previous one. One is infrastructure. Um, does the owner of the infrastructure have the control of this media mediation? Um, is data the same of, as information, and, and is that where the value is? And then finally, is it identity given by data? And if you look at the equations, then um, if they... And I'll go back to some of these questions. Let's look a bit at you know, how things have changed in terms of how we access information. So in sort of the old paradigm, not that it's completely old, we still do this, um, the pull paradigm, you search, so you have a search function, and um, when you search, you explicitly um, express an intent. Um, part of that is implicit, of course, but, but there's a query. There's an explicit query. And so basically what this gives you is a set. It's a defined set. Sometimes the set is very big, Right? If I type on, on a search engine, New York City, I will get hundreds of thousands of pages, but it's still a set. And so the job of the algorithms there is to uh, pick that X that should be, go at the top and then perform a, a ranking. Okay? Now, when you're doing discovery, as in many of the social networks and, and a lot of the um, social content that we're consuming, and the, like the news aggregators, for example, that you know, I just visit a page and I get a whole bunch of information, um, there's a delta, but this one is implicit because I'm just receiving it. I'm not implicitly, I'm not explicitly performing a query. So it's, this is potentially includes the entire universe. So the algorithms have to um, select um, information for me from the entire universe. Um, is this the same as ranking? It's not clear. Okay, and the big, and the second big um, important difference is that in the first one, um, the query is explicit, so it's done by a human. And in the second one, it's algorithmic, okay? When I check one of my um, social networking sites and I see all the updates, um, it's an algorithm that's deciding which updates I see, okay? It's not me. It's implicitly me through the actions that I've made before, which is what I was referring to um, in the previous slides about your connections and your implicit links. shift. Um, and so it all really comes down to three key challenges. The first one is information value. The second one is social structure representations. And then the third one, the third ones that we talked about, interaction, transfer, and effect. In order to be able to select the right content that I just described. Um, the first thing is that information value is not static. 
it is not absolute it in it, and it is not always individual so just think about that for a second okay it's constantly changing um, and it may depend on the aggregation of things and it's not absolute um, relationships at the same time are not discrete they're not fixed and they're not explicit and I'm talking about human relationships and this this you could even argue that this actually holds with uh, relationships with objects as well in some in some cases and then interaction transfer and effect they vary in meaning and content and, and scope um, clearly right depending on the context depending on on um, the scope of the interaction and the transfer um, there are big variations. So how do we study these things? And um, so um, I'll just mention a few of the things and the areas that I think we need to look at um, as, a, as a community. So the first one is information value. Um, and I think here we need to look way beyond information theory. Second thing that is extremely important is, di is diversity. This relates to information value as well, clearly, and has uh, strong economic impacts. And just as an example of some of the work that we've been doing in this area um, is um, analyzing web search, and you can uh, look at the paper later on, um, but grouping um, many, many, many people and their, their search queries and trying to find the differences in demographic groups and how, how they how they. Search. The second one is social structure. And so what is the role of culture and is... Um, and, and the fact that it's context dependent. How does this um, change um, the way that we interact and how does it, uh, how does it change social structure? Um, so um, as an example of this work, we did an analysis of um, a lot of uh, Twitter data and we looked at differences in the network in different countries. And we found that there are important differences in the way that the networks form in, in different countries. And then the next steps would include, of course, studying how information propagates and how these networks evolve. In terms of interaction, transfer, and effect, I think we need much deeper analysis of human-to-human -human communications. Um, there is a lot to be done in terms of understanding how we use social media, how we use technology, but especially how we communicate to each other and, and what things mean. And so for this, we need to uh, really take a look at a lot of the work in sociology, uh, psychology, anthropology, and, and many other uh, fields. This is a small example of work in this uh, direction um, at CIKM with Ingmar Weber. We looked at um, how certain queries, search queries in a large data set, um, happen in one demographic group and then happen in another demographic group. So as an example, if you have people that are searching for the N1H1 vaccine and it's only people from one demographic group, and then another demographic group is searching for the vaccine, at some point in the process, um, somehow that information was transferred, transferred, and it's not clear if it was directly between the two groups, but um, to look at. So I think all of these concepts really relate to um, what I call human-centered computing. And, you know, there, there are many people working in this field, and the basic idea is to put the user at the center, and then to do data analysis, form hypotheses, and look at design, and have all of that within a context. And it's a cyclic process where the user is, is at the center. And, and that's kind of the approach that I want to advocate in addressing these, these questions. Um, and at the same time, I think it's important that um, we look at the business opportunities that these questions entail, and specifically um, you know, with, within social network analysis and social networks. Um, how do these different types of analysis um, work and, and how can they be used to, for to providing better services for users in the end is is what matters so we we have a paper published on that um, and then development um, i think this is very linked to the previous slide because in my view um, business opportunities um, and development go hand in hand in the sense that if you're able to um, properly provide services for um, people in developing regions and emerging markets, um, the markets and the opportunities are big and then they have a strong impact and impact development. And as I said before, technology is playing such a crucial role um, that it's important for us to be inclusive and not just think of the West and, 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 and think of developed uh, nations. Um, in, in so human-centered computing is really at the intersection of social, cultural, psychological and economic factors. Um, and that intersection includes um, studying 
and techniques in machine learning context, user modeling, personalization, and this includes things like cultural analytics um, and um, in, interdisciplinary. Okay, and in terms of the actual fields of research and work, well, we need to look at user experience to understand the data. We need to do deep data analysis and then look at the human aspects to understand why people are interacting in a certain way within a certain context and why the data looks one way or, or the other. And then, of course, techniques using machine learning, user modeling, personalization for the issues that I described before, and all of this within the social context. Um, so we need to exploit, uh, in the good sense, um, the social aspects, content and implicit links. Um, and then, um, just to end uh, my presentation, the three key challenges, which I think generate a lot, I hope they generate a lot of discussion or information value, social structure representation, interaction, transfer, and effect. So thank you very much for um, listening. Dopo la musica fatta a pezzi da, da Munari e ricomposta da Ocapi abbiamo sentito anche una presentazione fatta a pezzi. Non so se tu, quelli di voi che sono riusciti a seguirla tutta, non lo so. Però stavo chiedendo adesso ai ragazzi del Topix se fosse possibile poi averle tutte su un sito, credo che sarà possibile, in qualche modo faremo in modo di recuperarle perché probabilmente questa senza le interruzioni sarebbe stata molto più fluida e comprensibile. Dovremmo avere in questo momento tra l'altro in diretta da Skype, su Skype Alex James, da Pechino mi pare, non so che ora sarà, che ora sarà a Pechino? È notte quasi. Alex! Ci sta secondo voi? Confermato? Alex! Ok Alex, welcome, welcome. Can you hear us? Okay, Alex, I would, try to, I would try to be very simple because the connection is not so good. So first of all, which software did you use for your presentation? It didn't work so well. <laughs> PowerPoint, okay. Uh, we, we, are going to we are going to use your presentation in, on the website of the conference so people can benefit uh, anyway and can download it and use it. And there, there, was, there was a question in the, the presentation that I couldn't get the answer. It's about the difference, uh, I mean, the, 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 the fact that uh, if big, da big data can be information or just noise. I mean, and I, I guess that the answer is that they, they can be a great source of information. But can you explain us why and how? Well, I think the biggest challenge is uh, basically they need to filter out uh, that data. And if there's no the proper filtering, then it's just going to be noise. So um, the, the, you know, the biggest shift is, I, I see is um, you know, from, from search where you have explicit queries to situations in which you're being bombarded by a bunch of information and question filtering. The search for and I think if we don't get that right, we're going to be basically swamped by noise, which is, I think, what's happening to a lot of us. Not just in terms of the web, but in terms of email, the phone calls. Um, a lot of the, the data that's coming to us is, is actually noise. So that's what I do. And the, in, in terms of data, it's, it's, most, uh, it's more efficient, it's more effective uh, sharing on Facebook or retweeting uh, a tweet. Oh, I think, I think this all depends on, on what the objective function is, right? I think there's sort of big issues in social media that everyone is kind of expecting a magic formula. And I don't think that there is a magic formula. Um, but I think everything really depends on exactly what the purpose is in the free print environment. You can say it's great for certain things. Facebook is great for certain things, and Twitter is great for certain things. So what, what the goal is. But you know, now in Italy, Twitter is gaining momentum now. It's very popular, even though it's uh, like one of 10 in proportion with Facebook. And, uh, but I think that actually the architecture of information on Twitter is much more effective. I mean, you can, you can uh, reach a much broader audience, theor theoretically. What do you think? Yeah, I, mean, I guess one of the big advantages of uh, Twitter is the fact that it's, it's open. So when you post something, choose to post it openly, anyone can, can see it. So that's a very different dynamic. And the fact that people don't have to be reciprocal when, they follow, when you follow them, 
also makes a, an open system that um, I think leads to um, quicker spread of information. But but at the same time, you know, it does create more noise in some sense, right? Sure. Um, but but I think from that perspective, yes, you know, the fact that it's open, I think, makes a huge uh, difference. And I think Google Plus also has some advantages that we shouldn't forget. And the, the final simple question, now we are in China? Are you in China yes. now? Yes. And, uh, any Beijing, any yeah. interesting new project going on for Yahoo in China now? Um, Something not that, you that can I'm aware of. Nothing that I can say. On. OK, OK. We'll keep you, we'll, you'll keep us updated. Thank you very much for joining the conference, okay. and good luck for everything. Bye, Alex. Thank you. I'm sorry that I couldn't be there. Thank you.